All right. Welcome to the One Within All Back to the Interverse podcast. And I have great news for you guys today. We're going to be talking about probably the most important thing that could ever be spoken about. And it's something we've gotten into many times before. And it's health. What is health? What is our perspective on health and how does it restrict or enable our ability to live life to the fullest? And today's guest, Sonia Barrett, is an activist of many different stripes, has been doing all kinds of great work for years on radio, podcasts, and even making films. So there's plenty of stuff that we could cover with Sonia, but today I'm going to kick us off with talking about her documentary from 2017, which is The Business of Disease. And it's a great movie to help you see the importance of, as Sonia says in the movie, being the keeper of your mind, body, and spirit and taking back control. And that's uh, just right up the alley of everything that's been going on this year. It seems like that movie was prescient. I watched it earlier today, and it's never been more important to recognize the type of lies and tricks that have been perpetrated on us by corporate pharmacy companies and governments and any other entity that artificially seeks to profit off of us, whether or not it's good for us. And I think at this point, we're all seeing and feeling the squeeze coming from that medical monarchy. We're going to talk about that quite a lot, but there's many uh, healing modalities we can also discuss with Sonia from sound to light and why even art can be important for properly growing your brain. Uh, with all that being introduced, I think you guys should make sure you check the show notes for links to Sonia online. The real Sonia Barrett.com is where you can find her website. And there are, I'll put a link in there for where to find the movie that we talk about as well. I personally found it on Amazon. I got some documentary subscription thing that let me watch it there, but that's because I was kind of in a hurry and I would have rather have done the pay-per-view through her actual website. So when I show it to someone in the future, that's what I'll do. And I hope you guys do that too, because this type of work sure isn't free to create. And she did a great job putting that movie together in a very professional way. And you'll, you'll feel inspired and your mind will be open, especially if you have only just begun to scratch the surface of these topics and, and health as a way of life, as opposed to something that you worry about when something breaks. Uh, also, speaking of money, you can support Interverse on Patreon. Five bucks a month gets you extra long podcast, and it's very worth it. So go do that, patreon.com forward slash Interverse. And we will go ahead and get this party started with Sonia Barrett, a true mystical visionary bridging the gap between science and spirituality, but in a simplified format that's available for everybody, because the truth is always simple. <laughs> So I'm ready to uh, deprogram and reprogram into some better perspectives with you, Sonia. Welcome to Interverse, and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, my, it's a, it's a pleasure. Yeah, and here we are. Yeah. So I'd love for you to talk about sort of your backstory and the work that you do, and uh, we can talk about your documentary too. But also, as a sort of free form freestyle podcast, I'm well open to anything that might be more currently on your mind than stuff from 2017 that you were working on. However, I want to make sure people have a good idea of uh, why they would like to watch that movie, regardless of where they're at in the process of their truth journey. Hmm. Well, let's see. All right. So there's a film and then there's obviously uh, me, um, me and my own crazy curiosity and um, ability to, to really dive into a great many things. Well, I've been at it for a while. And when I say I've been at it for a while, I mean that um, I went on this curious search. And in that curiosity, you know, stemming from largely in the 90s, before that, but largely in the 90s, uh, early 90s, like 92, um, what I realized is my search for a spiritual understanding led me into realizing this massive picture that involved politics and history and so much um, uh, that's imposed on society and human beings from uh, probably hundreds, thousands of years that, you know, that a certain behavior is not new. And, uh, and so I realized that I couldn't really understand one without really the other. Um, and so that's that's really how my quest um, started with that. And then I went down the rabbit hole and kept going down the rabbit hole. And I'm still going down the rabbit hole um, of, of discovery. 
So say I say that, uh, which that's a that's a massive that's a bigger story to even get into. But um, because of m- who I was in that sense, or who I am in the sense of of digging and discovering, and I remember in the month of October, I think it was in 2010, when I didn't realize at that time that it was you know the usual breast cancer awareness month. I, I didn't realize it. I just remember being in the store and be constantly asked if I wanted to donate. And that's where it all sort of came to me. Like, you know, you know, what is this? You know, what, what is going on? This, this, I felt like it was a more of a marketing of breast cancer. I feel like it was more a promotion. And so I thought in that moment, well, I wonder what all of this, how all of this is being interpreted by our brains, you know, by our minds, how are we processing any of this and all of the pink that was associated. And of course, then I started to think, you know, we, our first language is symbols and we tend to operate based on symbols. You know, a symbol can have so much attached to it. You know, we'll see you know, the UPS truck or FedEx or any of the things that we're so used to. All we need to see is the color brown and maybe, you know, a little symbol. We we just know that's what it is. And yet there's there's a whole concept that is embedded into a symbol. You know, we see the cars, you know, we, you know, Mercedes, Benz, Alexis, whatever. There is a concept that that is much easier um, embedded in a symbol. So that was really where that question began. And so I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to maybe interview a few people. That's really how it started. And so at first, um, it was the, um, the, the marketing of breast cancer, the pink ribbon agenda. That was an article that I wrote. And so that article can still be found on the website. Um, the, the real Sonia Barrett.com. So it is the marketing of breast cancer, the pink ribbon agenda. And so from that is where I decided to kind of put something together. Well, to my surprise, everybody was on board. So the, the name of the, the film then changed to, because now it was a bigger picture to the business of disease. And that's really how it came about. The cure is in the body, not in the business. Uh, and so um, in, in just setting out to connect with these people and having them bring their pieces to the table, that was more, it wasn't so much about, you know, just the, what's, what the pharmaceutical company is doing and how horrible it is. But I really felt that it was necessary for people to get a better understanding, um, about how their emotions, how, um, there's so many different components to them. And how all of these other levels uh, are affecting the health of their body. So that's why we had all those experts that we had from psychologists to um, people like Stephen Halperin, who um, Academy Award winner, you know, Dr. Stephen Halperin, who is magnificent with sound, you know, and music and and was was uh, major in launching um, these the new in the new age movement launching sound uh, ter- therapy, um, a lot of those things. So so I wanted to bring other components to the table so that we could look more at the design of the human being. We don't really get that information in school. Sure, we get a little biology, but, you know, but how are we really designed? How are we wired? You know, how do we um, take things in? You know, is how easy is it for us to be uh, converted to a a particular protocol or, you know, a projection of, of what to believe. So all of those things I felt were really necessary. And of course, the um, breast cancer aspect of it was always very huge to me because it was pink everything. It was, you know, pink toilet paper, uh, you know, the NFL store had pink items in it. It was just all of this to the point where I started to figure you know, when we see pink now, you know, you know, are we, do we automatically think this stuff? Um, and I'll say one more thing. One of the things that I did find interesting was how easily things are switched on us and we don't, 
realize it or we're not aware of it, particularly if you were born after a particular switch happened. And I'm talking about the pink and um, uh, blue. Blue, we know blue is for boys and, you know, pink is for girls. Well, was that always so? No, it wasn't. It used to be pink was for boys and blue was for girls. Pink was closer to the color um, red, you know, of blood and, um, you know, basically more war and a certain a certain state that they wanted the boys to have, males to have. And this, and blue was considered a softer color for girls. So I think it was in the 20s. It was somewhere around there that that switched. Now. Somebody might say, well, that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because what it shows you is how we can be changed, how our belief systems are regulated um, by others, by certain people. And we don't really question much of it because it's so automatic. And we were born after that period. So we automatically fall in line with blues for boys and pink is for girls. So the same thing has happened with everything else that we fell in line with. And it all leads to our understanding of how to run our bodies, how to regulate our bodies, how our bodies work, um, the health of our bodies, um, being, you know, are we being controlled, uh, indoctrinated? It, it, it has everything to do with um, the bigger picture. So anyway, so that's how I ended up doing producing the business of disease, which became something, you know, I thought I was doing a YouTube video. <laughs> Actually, that's what I thought. I had to just do something for YouTube. And, and then it turned into this, like this feature film. Um, so, uh, th so anyway, that was interesting and very, very necessary. And you're right, um, Chance, it's, it's more relevant today than ever, because in the very beginning of the film, there in writing, it says um, not to wait for government and systems to determine, um, you know, what's best for you and the direction of, of your life. You, it's up to the individual to take back ownership and responsibility fully of their spirit, mind, and body. And so that, that is always my message. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good crunchy message. Uh, I've got plenty of parts of that, that, could be expanded on in depth. I immediately thought about the simple thing when you presented that idea in the documentary, and I'm glad you expanded on it here because not only is there that association with the color pink and breast cancer, for example, but all those little ribbons to me, yeah. what popped into my head today is that if you turn sideways, it reminds me of like the Jesus fish, which reminds me of the Vatican, which reminds me of the history that I've only a little bit looked into, but enough to know that there's some definite shadiness there of like families um back in rome long ago like the medici clan and how the entire idea of um medicine began start began making its march towards where we're at today with it uh where we are putting authority outside of ourselves for everything and including our health which means that whenever something's going wrong we don't even allow ourselves the mental flexibility to try to figure it out ourselves, or to try to understand the signal our body's giving us. We just go to the mechanic or whatever. And that's the opposite of taking back control of mind, body, and spirit. Not that you shouldn't seek help from others when you need help or that, you know, a hospital can't help you with a broken leg or something, but that uh, if you're on automatic, if you just are like stimulus response and you're not motivated by your own will to do things, then your spirit less, because that's basically like in my understanding of mind, body, spirit, it's kind of a hierarchy where spirit guides the mind and mind guides the body. But if you take spirit out of the component, out of your entire equation, become two thirds. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Divide two by three, anybody, what's two thirds of a, a being? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many moving parts to this. And I think um, from what you're saying, Yes, we, I think human beings are naturally sort of, um, uh, I'm going to use the word program. There's another word I wanted to use, but to believe that they're not capable of being responsible for themselves. And 
um, that someone else knows what's best for them. And I think that's the model that we've operated by for, again, thousands of years. Um, is for a very long time, you always have an elite group of people who have, who have decided that the rest of society does need to be governed and need to be told what to do. So because of that, we have set up um, institutions like obviously like, you know, religion and of course, um, even, you know, politics, um, education, even in the corporate arena. Uh, you know, we, we talk about, you know, who's your, you know, who's your provider, who's your doctor, you don't have a doctor. I mean, it's like a big thing. If you don't have, you know, a, somebody specific to you, where's your doctor? Do, uh, what insurance do you have? Oh, who are you with? I mean, so we're just sort of, I don't have a doctor. <laughs> don't either. There's no one assigned to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's the programming though, is to look at someone strange when they, you know, when you ask them that question and they say they don't have a provider or they don't belong to a particular church or, or religious organization because we're conditioned to um, to place each other in categories. And those categories allow us to evaluate, um, you know, what who people are and what relationship we want to have with them. And it's the same thing with what career do you have? Oh, you're a doctor. Oh, you're a lawyer. Oh, you're, you know, whatever. Oh, I want to hang out with you. So, you know, or, or I don't want to hang out with you because you're not doing much. So we, we, we have these categories that you think, well, are they law? Not, they're not, they don't have to be law on paper because they're already law in here. You know, it's been passed down from one generation to the next. Our parents pass it down, you know, and we, you know, we pass it on to our children in absolute ignorance. And so, you see how easy it is to shape a society and even people who think that they're uh, so aware and awake and you just listen to them long enough and you realize, no, not really. You drank the Kool-Aid too. So <laughs> you drank the whole pitcher. So there, you know, so this is what we're dealing with. And so when much of society that's drank this Kool-Aid um, they look at people who didn't, aren't drinking the Kool-Aid and then they're thinking there's something wrong with you. You are what's wrong uh, with society because you're wanting to have absolute control over your over your vessel. I did a a short little video because I do these videos in the morning because I hike uh, a lot. I'm a hiker. And so I did I do these short videos generally after my hike because I don't. I don't carry my phone with me to talk about that real quickly. I don't carry anything with me when I go uh, on these trails. But then when I get back in my car, I'll shoot a, um, a video. And one of the things that I said um, just in, in, in writing it and adding it to Facebook was that your body is actually its own country, its own territory, you know, it, it's its own universe. I mean, it is really your own territory. I don't think people really realize that. Uh, and the way the system is set up, the system is set up to have people really thinking that they can't govern their territory. They can't govern their country, which is this vessel. Um, you know, because you're you're in this vessel. You're using it's a vehicle. So it's yours. It's uniquely yours. It's your signature to that vehicle. Uh, you know, you're uniquely tied to your body. So it is absolutely yours to govern. Um, and so I, anyway, so I, I, I found that interesting. You know, some people, you know, didn't say anything because some things you're not used to hearing and then you hear it and then you're like, geez, you know, self-responsibility. Self-responsibility comes to mind. And that's what people are, a lot of people are afraid of being completely responsible for themselves because why? You go back to the idea of the conditioning that you are not capable of being completely sovereign and responsible for yourself. So we find that we're all caught um, in under this umbrella um, uh, uh, of this system, this matrix system, this government matrix and this, this system that we called uh, the world, the matrix of the world, um, that we're all sort of networked into it in, in 
in 3D ways. We'll just talk about just in three third dimensional ways by all the contracts and terms of agreements that we, our parents have signed off on that we've uh, agreed to. Um, and it's been it's made difficult to operate outside of those terms and, and conditions. So we're dealing with a much bigger picture. Um, and I always like to say to folks, this is not about uh, fear. For me, this is not ever about fear. I mean, I don't have a fear of any of it. When you the more informed you are, the more removed you are from fear because you understand that you are truly a sovereign a sovereign being and yes you're going to make choices where you are interacting with the this construct anyway but to be aware of what you choose to interact with is completely different than to automatically and just randomly um throw yourself into the system and you're just dancing to the next simon says or or you know whatever you're told um, you, you know, information allows you to make more sound choices. And so that's what I do. And that's what my work is about. It's never about projecting fear. I don't use fear to sell anything. If anything, I am wanting people to wake up to themselves and to realize that they have the power to govern and they have access to information that is profoundly deep. And you and only you can tap into a certain part of yourself. Doesn't matter how much mind control there is. There is a part that it just, you can't access it. Only you can access it. Right on. Yeah, that that force that animates all life in the cosmos is the same thing that brings about the healing within you. And it, just like we disconnect from that force as it exists in nature through uh, corrupt versions of technology in a way through through pushing our responsibility outside of ourselves to others and living in these <laughs> rectangular boxes. One interesting thing in your documentary was about how the even the shapes of rooms have a tonal frequency to them and influence right. that they put on you, which man, I'm tell me about it. The more the healthier I get or the more imbalance I get, the more I notice the little things that can throw off your system. I think that's confusing to those that are in a state of dis-ease because everything feels off, but that's normal and unchanging. So it doesn't, they don't realize that it's like, I always say the example of like a smoker doesn't know how good they would feel not being a smoker. They think right. they feel normal until they quit for a while. And then they're like, wow, this is way better. But what's really important here, I think, is something you said again at the beginning. Um, uh, about Kool-Aid. Nobody should drink Kool-Aid ever. <laughs> it's terrible for you. But no, I'm kidding. You talked about categories and how we evaluate things based on categories. Well, what is a categorization other than putting a title or a noun on something? And what are we in truth other than a verb? We're not anything that's a, a noun. We're nothing static. We are an expression in motion in the present moment. So Whenever you put categories on things, that's artificial. And once you have categories, it's a very short step to then evaluate things based on the category. Well, what's the word evaluate? Evaluate. I mean, it almost sounds like you're saying you're taking their energy, valuing it, and then eating it. Right. Um, it's, it it's, it's vampiric and it's artificial. Like as soon as you start to, your body itself is the temple of the cosmos, the temple of God, however you want to say it. Because like you mentioned, it's a... Uh, it is its own universe. It's a fractal image of everything. If you change one thing in your body and in your health, things will change in your external world that you can't predict or control what those changes will be. But it's guaranteed, in my experience, that you have to change your health. You have to change your relationship to yourself, to your mind, body, and spirit if you want to move outside in the world to a different place. And I think this is like where people are really stuck. First, they have the artificial evaluation of time, which is a construct, and it can be useful. But whenever you're living by that construct and in a survival oriented mode, trapped in the root chakra, uh, because you can't bring your energy up higher because there's so much blockage there, you end up going in a loop like you're on a record spinning around and around in a circle. And that's what I call chronos. I call that the fake time because there is that time isn't real. The only thing that's measuring is cycles in nature that are eternal and never really changing. It's the sky clock. But... 
your personal growth and development as a being, how you evolve spiritually, how you change physically, what you do in your life that changes your life or changes the life of others. That's the real time. That's the real marker of change. That's the real journey. And so we have to get out of the loop of Kronos fake time and onto our actual arrow of time, which is not even linear, it's expansion. We expand sure, even is, backwards in that case. Like we even right. start to remember things from our past that we lost and reintegrate those as we expand. So I think so that, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But nature is priceless and your body is nature. So um, what I wanted to say, well, the last thing I know I've kind of been going on, but medical treatments changed a lot, even in just a hundred years. And there was a time in the past where in some places you would pay a doctor like a subscription fee and they would come check on your family monthly. And if grandma got sick, you didn't pay him. So the evaluation of that relationship was that it was valuable to the practitioner to keep the family well and uh, give them the right advice for how to not get sick. Whereas now the, uh, the evaluation, the value on the relationship with healthcare practitioners is typically that you pay them when you're sick. Actually, your insurance pays them. It's a whole thing. It's a crazy thing. And I think that's a huge value flip that um, we need to really recognize and, and reverse if we can. Right. Uh, absolutely. And yes, in the film, I know um, Dr. Jacob Lieberman had even pointed out the fact that in the old days, when the doctor came to the house, they, they didn't just check out, you know, one thing. It was it was your a whole thing you know, from your eyes. Everything was connected. It's not, you know, just checking over here. They disconnect the mouth and the, the, the eyes from the body. And yet, the entire thing is working together. All your teeth, um, you know, each one of them, you know, they have roots. They're connected. You know, they have a connection to your rest or the rest of your body, to your fingers, your fingertips. You know, everything is is truly um, connected. And I think that's really important for people to understand. That's the reason why we have so many challenges with allopathic medicine, which what we call traditional medicine, um, because of all the fragmenting that they do with isolating, um, you know, maybe removing a cancer from over here in this part of the body, but that's really not the root of the problem. Uh, it began somewhere else in the body. And so sometimes you get it springing up someplace else in the body, even after it's been removed. It's because the, 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 the root, the actual root um, issue was never resolved. And that's why it keeps, the body keeps trying to fix itself. And, and that's what those things are. I think if we start realizing that dis-ease is really a signal um, to the body. And usually it's an extreme signal after all the other subtle signals have been ignored. It goes into extreme signals. And that's really what happens. Dis-ease is your body looking for ease. It's trying to notify you um, that, you know, there's some things here, you know, the house is starting to be on fire. (laughs) What are we going to do? How are we going to put this, this out before it spreads? And so, um, we find that the emotional aspect once again plays a huge role because what we're dealing with frequencies and the emotions of our frequencies. I mean, uh, the frequencies of our emotions, um, have a great effect on the body and the cells and the, uh, the, the very, the circulation of the blood on the lymphatic system, um, on, you know, whether your lymphatic system is going to be stagnant or not, along with obviously the food. And I say food is important, but I don't think people realize that the emotional part actually even overrides the food. Because if you're in a in an emotional crisis all the time and you are really you're either going through some stuff or you're holding on to some issues of the heart or whatever you're like holding on to um, t- tightly, you have to understand that the thought process and even those frequencies will make the body acid, moves the body into an acid state. And when the body is in an acid state, based on what you're processing and going through emotionally and locked up and you don't, you know, you're not talking, all of that, then you've got the food. Now you put in food that's going to make the body acid. Now the body is trying to compensate. It's trying to process the foods that are acidic and um doesn't really align 
with the fact, and it doesn't align, and then you've got the the, the body trying to uh, regulate, deal with the emotions, keep you alive, so that you don't get you know either completely extremely depressed or whatever it is. So it's working over time. Now, if you're in a content, happy mood, and you genuinely are feeling freer and happier, the food you're eating, um, not that you're, you're eating low frequency foods and you should eat it, but it actually will not have quite the same extreme effect because your body is able to try to process and regulate but it's too much when it's trying to regulate uh, your your hidden emotions and all the stuff that's trapped there along with the stuff that you're eating. So I think those things are important to um, to understand. And, you know, what you're saying is that the body is nature. And I think that's something that's so missing, um, especially in what's going on today. And I, I, I don't even want to get into what's going on today because it's so it's so big. And some of the things that to talk about. I, I honestly cannot even talk about it on um, on camera. But the fact of the matter is that um, it's not mentioned at all about nature, about the fact that um, of everything, that is what keeps us going. That's what's that's what's regulating. Yes, it is regulating everything. It's regulating the clocks. It is. Um, cycles, you know, that are uh, constantly in motion. But there's a lot there. Uh, uh, nature has the healing. It has the the formula. It has everything that is needed. Just the same as the body is designed to have uh, to be for the immune system to work. Well, the immune system works best when all of those things that I mentioned are in a more balanced state. The, the, the foods are not low frequency foods um, and your emotions and all of that maybe aren't at an extreme low as well in frequency. So we those things are not being addressed at all uh, today and they're playing a major role in people and their eating and the obesity and um, you know all of those things that are going on. Those are really important. Now, I also want to mention, yes, I hike um, all the time. I hike every day. I've been hiking for a very for, for many, many, many years. I get up and I go hiking. But I don't bring my cell phone with me. And I'm bringing that up because there are people that really have developed a, fall, developed a false sense of security with, with their phones. You know, um, oh, you, go, you don't bring your phone? You should be careful. Like suddenly my phone is going to like rescue me. Um, you know, no, what you do is when we go in nature, at least for me anyway, again, I've been doing this for a while. So I know what to listen to. I tune in. And that's the whole idea of being out in nature is can you be present enough when you are in nature that you are again in sync with nature enough to know what, where to go if you get a sense of go down this path or don't go down this path or just tuning in and hearing, you know, what, what, whatever is going on. That is the kind of connection that we're supposed to get back into. The, having your cell phone, is it, it completely disconnects you from truly being bonded with the healing powers of nature. You're, we're so focused on making sure that you've got signal, uh, you know, out there. It's like, oh my God, if I, if I get lost, no, you won't get lost because guess what? You're paying attention. You you are in tune with where you are, so you know how to get back to wherever it is. So it's that kind of disconnection. It sounds so simple and so maybe unimportant, but I tell you, it is super important. Another thing, real quick, I want to point out that I pointed out on a few other shows. Um, I like to remind people that, you know, when you remove all of this, when you remove, if you remove every building, if you remove everything that we call our houses and all of that, would the human race still be able to continue? Absolutely. Uh, because you could, what? You could, didn't matter where you are, two people could produce a child. Everybody's naked, but guess what? 
Life is going on and we survive because at the end of the day, that's really the truth of all we have. That's re- everything else is just all of the things we've manufactured, which is great because it's part of the human experience. But we have gotten lost with, and confused with thinking that that's the thing when nature, at the end of the day, when you strip it all away, that's all you have. You have naked human beings and the planet and the animals. That's it. That's all that we have. Let's bring that back to our attention. And if, and if that is the case, then guess what? Then all the healing properties and everything that is needed to keep, uh, for nature to keep everything going must be provided. It's obviously there. It's, the body is also designed to fix itself under the right conditions. What are the right conditions? All of a lot of what I've said and then some. So the conditions that we live in today are not necessarily ideal. We're stressed out. We're in fear. We're a lot of external information that we're sucking up. We're disconnected from our own intuition and our own inner guidance. Complete disconnection, which puts everything in absolute chaos all the time internally. Take yourself out into nature. Don't tell me about, oh, they're mosquitoes. Hey, you are born. That's it. You are born on the planet. There was no buildings or anything. You would still be okay. And you would learn to be in harmony with whatever it is you would need to be in harmony. In. So, so that's my spiel on that is bringing people back away from all this other artificial security and safety and alarms. Oh, you know, you got uh, your alarm on your house. You got to make sure. Let me tell you something. If somebody wants to break in, they're going to break in. I mean, uh, you know, that, that's the God's honest truth. You know, it's the truth. There is no, no alarm that can keep someone out if they want to. However, if the more aligned we are away from the idea of fear and so uh, running towards this idea of security, the more we run towards this thing is the more we run towards the fear is the more we run, we run towards the thing that we're running away from, right? Because you keep calling it to you. So let's come back to that space. Let's get away from the marketing companies that are marketing um, the, the commercials that you see about somebody breaking into the house, people hiding in the closet, but then they come out and tell you, oh yeah, but, but if you get our uh, service, We'll protect you. Um, insurance companies with the you know car accidents, or I'm driving down the, the, the street and I'm hearing this thing on the radio, big car crash. Oh, and then they tell me about their insurance company. All those things are just programming you more and more with fear. It's all artificial. There, none of those things really protect you. What protects you is your own ability to tune in to the natural resources that are there. You're naturally hooked up and connected and have a sense of awareness if we allow it. Yes, <laughs> you're speaking speaking my message really too. Like I am with you 100% that there's no safety net in nature because nature wanted you to flow or to glide or to fly, however you want to put it. That by getting in tune with nature's law itself, we are therefore protected by the fact that we're doing the right thing. We have the greatest chance of survival if we do the things that we're meant to do to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, and so what you're talking about with artificiality in modern society, I also agree that there's so much about it that could be great and that is great and helpful to us. But Right. So I'm not a complete like anti-technology person. We got we got to know that technology is art, and art means artifice or artificial, which means anti-nature. So the only way that art could be good for us or technology could be good for us is if it follows nature. There's no other way. If you put it before the nature, if you use the art to exploit the nature, you're damaging your own nature. So good luck with that hum- humanity. But <laughs> uh, I think that. It's obvious, too. It's like everything evil is just the inverted version of something good. And so living backwards, live backwards is evil. If you put art before nature, that's evil. If art follows nature, it's harmony and it's the healing art. It is art. I mean, in the true sense of the word, nature really is uh, (laughs) is, is art. I mean, it is. It's the imagination of that which cannot be defined 
um, that has manifested. So that is the original nature is the original artist in in what is being created and is and continues to be recreated. You know, we are a work of art. I mean, you know, you know, we're all an amazing work of art. Um, and it is yet at the same time, it is all um, technology, but on a different level, on a cosmic level. So it's the languaging and how we're interpreting it based on what? The indoctrination based on what we've been told. When we say technology, immediately we go to our cell phones and we think the computer and all of that. Well, there's a greater technology, you know, of creation. There's a greater technology of creation, which is the ability to um, transform out of uh, patterns, you know, patterns that are, that that it brings about. And out of patterns come, obviously, forms, these forms. So it's all how we start looking at the, the deeper science of, of all of this. And I, technology is great. Technology, as we use it today and understand it, it is, it is great. But we cannot have it be masters over us. We must understand that part of it. We can't, you know, you give yourself over to it. We can enjoy it. But at the end of the day, we always, like you were saying, we have to come back to center. We always have to come back to center. Otherwise, we're going to get lost in all of this other, um, for lack of a better word, artificial um, constructs. Yeah. So, okay. To turn back a little bit to something from the beginning that I think that at this point, we've really probably made a good case for and we could put a fine point on it is the idea of how a disease is marketed back to the breast cancer awareness campaigns and how certain symbols just remind everyone of certain things like that little red spiky ball that doesn't actually exist. It's an artist rendering. It's an artificial image uh, that is so talismanic. It causes some people a lot of, you know, fear and stress. It does. Um, so let's talk about the possibility that mass belief uh, could actually create a negative resonance in suggestible people that a program programmability to their body if uh, if they're not immunized to the to those you know false beliefs by the fact that they look for truth within. Well, I mean, well, knowledge obviously, as I said before, knowledge is the absolute um, key because when you have a level of awareness, you're pulled back from the fear as opposed to being so pulled into the fear that you start to manifest um, symptoms and different things that um, that have been projected to you and, you know, almost feel better when there's evidence of it because now you don't have to worry about it anymore. I mean, so so there is that weird wiring that, you know, that we have. Um, but yeah, the fear of and I think that's what you're saying. The, the fear, is that correct? The, the, the fear of all of these potential things that are out there, whether it be the commercials, advertising, or marketing a disease, because that's what they do, uh, marketing an illness, um, and then with the symptoms, and which is your signal to figure out if you, you know, if you have any of these symptoms. If you find yourself uh, sleeping, you know, if you sleep at night, you know, that could possibly be a problem. <laughs> so it's, if, if you find that you're still breathing, that could be a problem. You might want to use this. I mean, so it's like all of these things, these commercials that are so suggestive. And some people are more vulnerable than other people um, to the suggestions and taking it, take it in and develop these issues. I've known um, one relative in particular, I, well, two, two relatives, two people in particular that, um, had such a fear of a thing of something happening and that they ended up getting it. And one of them before she passed, I remember she said to me, she said, you know, I used to say that I had this. I used to say it all the time that I didn't have it. And then I said it enough times where finally it happened. And some people might go, well, no, no, you know, maybe not. No, the power of suggestion with us, we are very pliable. The brain is very pliable. Um, we're very suggestible. The brain takes its instructions, it's an interface. It takes instructions from the mind, from, from us, from our thoughts, uh, from our beliefs. Not everything manifests. 
Um, but certainly a great many things do make their way into our lives. But I remember, and this was my, my sister-in-law at the time, and she said that, and I had no idea that she had been thinking all of that, that her fear, and she ended up, you know, getting this illness, sick, and I mean, she eventually died. Um, the other person was actually um, my my mother that raised me, and she's been gone for a long time, since 1984. And I remember she said, um, she said, I used to think, she says, I, I don't want to live. She's like, she used to pray not to live past uh, like 60, I think she said 60 or something, because she thought it was old. And I remember, I think the day before, maybe a day or two before um, she had actually passed, she said that to me. And I said, well, it's not too late to change it. She said, you know, I wished really hard that I would not live past that age. And she was that age. And she said, she, that's what she said. She said, and here it is. Uh, that's what's happening. And I said, it was not too late to change it. And she says, no. It's too far gone now. It's too late. Um, so th- th- my my point is that there's so many people who have made silent choices in, in on their minds based on belief systems that they have, based on a great many things, and they don't realize not necessarily just with a disease, <clears throat> but with the conditions that we find ourselves in in our lives not realizing how we got there, not remembering some of the choices that we made, some of the conclusions that we came to in our minds, some of the decisions, the concrete decisions that we made about certain things in our minds. And, you know, the, all of that has brought us to this moment. So I think the more, like we're talking right now, and for somebody listening, this might be giving them more clarity. They may be stopping and thinking about some of the things that they have set in their in their lives in their mind and they're thinking wow and then they're looking at where they are right now they're watching the trail as to how they got here and the choices and in this moment they think oh my gosh what what have i done and in this moment if that is what you're seeing with yourself it's not a time to beat yourself up it's not a time to have regret it's a moment of Wow, I am so glad that I see that. That's how you turn that into an opportunity. I am so glad that in this moment, I am waking up to how I have been operating. So what happens now? I am choosing to operate completely different. I realize that I don't have to be this way. I don't have to be this way. I don't have to be any particular way. I can change in any moment. And I think that permission, giving self, giving yourself permission, even if somebody is, somebody you know, might be have some sort of illness, I think we even have to look at that. How much ownership have we given to our illness? How much have we, you know, oh yeah, my diabetes, oh my, 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 this, my high blood pressure, my, you know, whatever. It's, 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 it's so much ownership. It's so much taking it on. Now, it's not to say that you're going to deny the fact that maybe you're dealing with these symptoms, with these things that reflect what might be defined as diabetes, but you don't have to own it. You don't have to take it on. In this moment, you can say, okay, I know there is a way to create some balance in my body. I'm not taking ownership of this. I'm not taking it on to integrate into being a part of me. Like this is, this is who I am. No, my body is saying we need to do some things. And I can recognize that my body is saying we need to make some changes. And you know what you're doing. Sugar, this, that, you know, if you're going to be truthful with yourself, you know, the stress maybe that you've been under that's triggered it, that's increased it. I mean, if we take a truthful look at our, ourselves, that is the magic right there. If we can be honest with where we are without shame, guilt, blame, but see it as a golden opportunity to begin to give ourselves a different set of instructions, I think we would be surprised. We have that capability to do that. 
And that's something that I like to um, reinforce with people. You have the power to make all kinds of changes and to turn a great many things around. You don't have to take it on um, and, and, you know, nurture it and that's it. And we would be shocked to find out just how many things, illnesses come up in the body and they go away. We would be shocked since we don't go to the doctor every day. We're not being tested every day. We would be shocked, as they say, to see how many cancers came up and left. We would be really surprised, but things are coming and going in this body all the time and the body's fixing it, except for when it maybe you end up with something that now required a bigger your attention and you didn't you know, listen to the signals before, but then you also still have an opportunity to possibly turn that around. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> wow. Uh, there's, that was just amazing. I, I kept having uh, things pop in my head that then you would flow into next. And I, was in your head. I think it's very all encompassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you really did encompass though that realization that our what we believe in, uh, especially about ourselves, is really constructing our experience of reality. Not in like an artificial way or even a magical way. It's just like your your body is going to act the way that you tell it to act, even with simple things. Like I used to have a problem, a bladder problem. Like if I need to go to the bathroom like yeah. that, I'd be toast. But then at some point, I think after learning breathing exercises and getting more body attunement awareness, like I can just be like, okay, body, calm down on that. We're going to take some deep breaths. We're going to relax the tension in the bladder. And I promise we'll take care of it soon, but you don't need to keep giving me the signal. Because the reason why, and with pain, pain is perfect. The reason why pain is blaring at you is because you need to listen to it and do something about it. And actually, I've found that even when I would like get injured, if I would put my attention on the pain and try to focus on the, what the pain felt like, it would immediately be less intense. It's the ignoring that causes right. the signal to get louder. It gets louder and louder. And it's like, knock, knock, knock. I'm just going to keep knocking, knocking, knocking until you actually pay attention to this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the body is powerful. It's uh, designed incredibly. And I don't think that we've even tapped into, we, we haven't even tapped the body's capabilities yet. It's the most magnificent. Uh, if we talk about high design cosmic technology, it's the most magnificent um, cosmic, uh, or, or, or what should I say? I can't even find the words in engineering that you could ever imagine. It is just so incredible. And we got it. It's like a computer. You know, you, you have an amazing computer, but there are things that you have not even tapped into. You buy a program and you only use some a couple of things in the program because they're the software because you don't know how to use it. So you only use these three things and you don't use the other things, but those capabilities have always been there. And that's what I see with us. It's an amazing design and um, and nature is really waiting for us to, to tap into um, all of these features then that are there. Right. I, even You use the word engineering. I just had like a mind blow about it. I'm just kind of obsessed with playing with words and breaking them apart to see if we can get more of an understanding of what the word really means to us on the deeper inner level. And engineering, it's like when you solve a problem or you create something that uh, was not a function that you had before, right? But how do you do that type of an expanding is in gen, so like a gen generator, generating within earring so it makes me think of like your inner ear your intuition when there's something to be solved the people that are problem solvers they ask themselves okay how do i solve this problem and then the self reflects back ideas because right. you're listening but then this the person it's just like with art too someone that says they're not creative is because they're telling themselves i don't know what to do they don't ask themselves the question of what do i do next and it's just like a one step at a time like okay what's next okay what's next and you can literally bounce back and forth with that left brain, right brain, mirror structure that you are embodied in, in this human car. And it's great. It's actually like, I mean, some people say that they, they that's them talking to God. I say it's talking to the higher self or the deeper self. Mm -hmm. Other people will say it's guides or spirit guides. And maybe there's a combination of things that you right. can talk in gen ear, the third ear. I like to call it the third ear. <laughs> it's like the third eye. <laughs> the, but Let's um, move towards the wrap up here. I mean, there's a lot of things. If you have a little bit of time for 
more or we could talk again later i'd like to get into which specifically would be different healing modalities that you might know about and things that were talked about in the movie and also this conversation i didn't uh, have this in mind when we started but now i'm really curious to pick your brain about the idea of life extension both the uh, what's happening on the artificial life extension world and also maybe like if there's the possibility of some sort of spiritually attuned life extension <laughs> that doesn't yeah, require artificial yeah. means. Yeah, uh, that's like my, um, <laughs> that's been my, I think my biggest focus, I think since I was born on the planet and, and that's a lot of my work is, um, is how do we move, you know, how do we move into that, that area, which is why I say all the untapped capabilities of this, uh, this vehicle, um, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information there and yeah, it, it has, it, it, it all leads back to what those who run things on a bigger level, I'm not talking to little government, but I'm talking about all these, these other, you know, secrets, hidden secret societies and all, all these other systems that are there, um, that have always wanted to, to some degree, uh, keep a certain certain level of information or access a certain level of information, but they never saw that the average person um, should have access to that information or even think in that direction. You know, hence the limitations imposed by religion of um, of what you know, where you go, what happens, and then you die. And then you know, and so you see you see the pattern as to how that works if everybody's caught in that zone you most people will not be thinking outside of um that frame of reference but there's so much more reality is was just much more incredible and expansive than what we've been sold yep just got to get over that hurdle of fear and then everything becomes clear yeah, yeah take ownership <laughs> take ownership yeah. Okay. Well, Sonia, remind them where they can find you. Anything you want them to know about coming up with you, um, and you know, floor is yours. Whatever you would like to say to the audience. And thank you for being here. It's been a really fun first hour. Um, Matt was right. <laughs> Our mutual friend Matt Landman kept telling me I needed to talk to you, and I'm so glad we did. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah. And well, my main website is therealsoniabarrett.com. Therealsoniabarrett.com. And it, you're able to connect with pretty much everything there. Um, my the well, the documentary website is thebusinessofdisease.com, and the radio site is theexpansionzone.com. Um, and then everything else you you will find there. I do a monthly free teleconference called Reality Wednesdays. It's the first Wednesday of every month, and I also have a members platform where. Uh, it's called expansion, the expansion portal, where we, we somehow we've been taking more so apart some of these newer sci-fi films. I mean, we're really taking them apart and connecting them with um, what we would define as is as realistic as you know the the information that these writers are are getting and all of that. So we get into some heavy, really heavy duty things and. I do a year, a retreat every year. Um, obviously right now this is going on, but it hasn't stopped us. So we do, you know, I do a yearly retreat and all, again, uh, workshops, every, all the workshops, everything I've ever done over the last, I don't know, 10 years. Um, it's on the website because I don't do the same thing. Um, twice. I don't like do a workshop and I do it over and over the same workshop. It's always expanding. So because of that, we, there's a trail left. Uh, from the from over here from the beginning to leading up to here and there's a lot of interesting stuff and tons of articles there's articles that go back to 2001 some of them are very predictive of now if you go and you look because people still find them and post them and go you wrote this in 2005 and 2011 and and here we are right now so there's tons of um of that kind of thing uh on the website so just just Check out um, therealsoniabarrett.com and hopefully you'll come and join us at one of the free monthly um, teleconferences. Yeah, you've got so much to offer. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have benefited and appreciate it. So thank you everybody for listening and uh, we'll see people on the second hour.
Hey, you made it to the outro. What's up? Thanks for listening. If you're new to the show, followed Sonia over here. Thanks for tuning in. I think if you like what she gets up to, you'll probably find many of the topics on the Interverse archive pretty interesting. And it was fun to get to know Sonia. I've been recommended her by Matt Landman several times. Matt being one of the most frequent frequenters of the guest seat here. And uh, yeah, he was definitely correct. I'd seen her work before. He pointed her out to me, so she was definitely on my radar. But glad I finally got this one going. And, you know, I'm always up for good suggestions for people to bring on. So if you have any ideas, have any movies or books that you think, man, this is right up his alley. (laughs) Let me know about it. I I can't promise I'll have time or it'll pique my interest, but I'll definitely look at everything that I'm sent. I always do. And man... There is just so much uh, to possibly go towards from here. I mean, I feel that the conversation I had with Sonia in her movie, if you went and watched it, which if you didn't, why not? Go for it. It's only a little over an hour. But the we left a lot on the table here is what I mean. Like we got into the business side of disease, sure. But we left a lot unsaid about different holistic methodologies for getting back to a healthy state, a balanced state. And I would love to have a deeper uh, examination in a future episode just about, and I guess we've probably talked about this before, but about how disease and and, uh, even physical injuries can be very connected to our personal energy field. And, And that really that's where the template for everything our body is doing is coming from. So makes perfect sense that we could use really subtle tools like sound healing, tuning forks to do big things to shift our body. But I think also the belief has a lot to do with it. Like, <laughs> I I wonder how many people have fallen ill this year just out of that belief that there's something going around for them to catch. And obviously, if you've even looked at a little bit sideways at the testing methods for the current scam that's going around you find out that oh wow they're, the test they're doing to test for this is like totally bunk and uh it was never even intended for this type of test so really uh, it makes sense to me that a lot of people would think they're getting sick get tested and maybe come back positive because you know that thing's bunk and then they add to the growing mass hysteria belief that there's this pandemic but for me, I I can see a pattern here. Like this has happened before a bunch of times. And interestingly, it often coincides with big economic changes. They change the economy around, change the monetary system, you know, every hundred years or so, got to reset the game and make sure that those who rose up or were about to (laughs) maybe get put back in their place, (laughs) play a new game of musical chairs, start over. But hey, uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I love you. (laughs) I'm not doing this for just for the fun. I mean, okay, yeah, I'm doing it just for the fun. But I also am doing this because I think the conversations that help me out hopefully can help you out. And if you want to help me help you out with these type of chats and you want to get more of it, there's Interverse Plus for you right there on Patreon. Only five bucks a month. Seems like with the rate of inflation going up right now, that's going to be... A very easy ask, five dollars a month. I mean, what can you, you can't even buy that much with five dollars? It's it's such a small amount these days. And yeah, you get a whole second hour of the show. You get to help me have more funding to make this more of a full time gig if I can ever get there. Seems like I'm getting there slowly but surely. And there are a lot of you out there that are already helping. I appreciate that. If you're curious about what we talked about in the plus extension this time around. It was interesting. We totally shifted gears. I mean, not totally because it's all related. It's all health and stuff and and spiritually oriented. But we talked about being able to view the programs through a higher perspective, getting above the mind, seeing what's actually going on in the mind to disentangle a lot of that stuff that's controlling our behavior and uh, deadening our sensitivity and our experience of life and armoring us from being able to have contact with ourself and the world. We talked a lot about lifespans, natural and artificially extended technology uh, compared to spiritual abilities and what the future looks like for human lifespans. 
And the very most interesting thing about this long discussion to me was considering how we believe that we should die at a certain time, we should get old, and the belief that, oh, I wouldn't want to live forever because of this, that, or the other thing. And look, I'm not going to say that I need, like I'm scared to die and like I need to live forever. But this conversation changed my mind about whether or not I would want to. I mean, don't we, aren't we already forever? So uh, I get that there's a sort of like a benefit to starting over and wiping your memory and reincarnating and all that. But we're not tapping the full potential of a single human being in any one person's life. I, it's not like the infinite novelty of nature and of our abilities and our creativity and our, our positive and harmonious art could ever end. Hey, ha. How many things can you really master in one lifetime? And how many people even master a, a single thing in their lifetime? I mean, I guess everybody masters something, even if it's sitting on the couch and watching TV. I'm personally a master at video games. <laughs> yeah. But if you had more than one lifetime, say two, how many more things would you master? I think it would be an exponential curb because the first thing you have to get a handle on is discipline. One thing I like to say is uh, freedom is self-mastery. And I really think that's true. And if you got to the point of self-mastery and then you had a long time to live, what could you accomplish? You know, and uh, there's always that population thing that everyone would say would be a problem if humans lived a lot longer. But wouldn't we just be more intentional about it? And wouldn't a lot of people, I don't know, I mean, this is all hypothetical anyway, but maybe... I mean, living for 200 years, you're probably only going to be able to bear children for still relatively a similar amount of time as a normal lifespan. Okay, so anyway, I'm going on and on about this. Just listen to the second hour if you want to hear us talk about living forever, pros and cons, <laughs> and how we might get there or why we might want to or why we might not want to. And uh, yeah, there's way more in the conversation, but I'll just leave it there because uh, it all kind of revolved around this idea of immortality, both the positive and negative ways that immortality is um, pursued. <laughs> so, yeah, you can get on plus for that. And um, there was one thing that this conversation made me think about a lot, though. The first hour, I guess, was how stress causes this dis-ease in the body, unmanaged stress, I guess. And it reminds me of when I was in my early 20s. I actually, OK, this started maybe when I was 18. Man, I can't believe, I mean, it feels like I'm a different person when I think back on this guy. I know it was me. I mean, of course it was me, but as an 18 year old, I had, you know, basically zero knowledge about what it meant to take care of my body. Uh, I lived on McDonald's and dorm food, like cheeseburgers and pizza and soda and waffles and ice cream, like every day. That was all that I was putting in here. And I was super sedentary. I went from being like a a sports player in high school to a World of Warcraft guild leader. <laughs> and I was in a bad, unbalanced relationship full of attachment to a version of myself that I wasn't. And uh, it was very stressful. And I gained a hundred or so pounds. Like just imagine me and add a hundred ish, maybe more, you know, I wasn't weighing myself a lot out of feeling ashamed, but add that to the frame of a normal six foot one guy. And you've got a pretty uncomfortable situation because I put that weight on within a matter of like a year and a half or two years. It was crazy. And during that time I was in the same relationship. And so the reason I want to talk about it is because how did I change? How did I lose all that weight? I know losing weight can be difficult for people. I'm, I guess the type of body that puts it on and takes it off fat and muscle really quickly. I mean, my weight fluctuates like crazy, but, you know, all our bodies are different. But what happened for me was that I didn't really even change my diet. I did get more active, but I learned to meditate and I got out of that bad relationship and I started enjoying cannabis. And about a year later, definitely within a year and a half or two years, I was back to my back to fighting shape, if you will, <laughs> back to my old body type, body shape, body size. And I've had some fluctuations since then, but mostly not. And definitely seems stress related. Like 2020 put a few on me. My favorite dad joke was that I got the COVID-19 pounds. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, you've probably heard me make that joke too many times already if you listen to the show a lot. Still, what what did I do about it this time? Well, I just I was already eating pretty healthy, maybe too much, but I just got back into the gym. And for me, that seems to be a big de-stressor to just uh, get physical exercise. And yeah, so the things that we need are all there. The tools that we need to heal and to get healthy, it's all there. And I'm sure most of us have experienced weight fluctuation. And I think that it's important to get real about it with ourselves. I mean, I ignored the weight fluctuation. I was going through the weight gain this year for too long and it went too far. And, uh, you know, it's not that you're a bad person if you are overweight, but it causes discomfort to be in your own skin. And it's kind of like, kind of like a person that, you know, smoking Marlboro Reds a pack a day. They don't know how bad it feels to be in their body uh, relative to if they weren't doing that unless they quit. And that's something I know from experience too, from back when uh, that time I'm talking about early twenties when, uh, yeah, I was smoking stuff like that as well. And I remember when I finally quit, I was like, oh, this is what it feels like to not be on that all the time. And we forget just like everything that we consume is a type of drug from food to what we consider to just be recreational things. I mean, it's all drugs like this coffee I'm about to take a drink of. Ah, yeah, <laughs> I like to speaking of remaining in ignorance, I like to ignore how when I drink too much coffee, I get so jittery and uncomfortable. And uncomfortable is the word that I'm wanting to focus on because I think the crazy shit that's going on in the world has a lot to do with people's body dysphoria, meaning that it does not feel good to be in your body. And that causes you to associate a lot of things uh, with the not feeling good. Pretty much everything you do. And it might be unconscious. You might be ignoring that it doesn't feel good to be in your body. But it... If you don't like being in your body, it's not a far stretch to body hate. And body hate is like kind of the foundation of the controller religions of the world. Those <laughs> desert sky god Abrahamics, right? Like the world is, you know, the world is a prison or your body isn't your real body. And you're going to go to heaven after this body dies. And so just do the right things or believe the right stuff and don't worry about your health because you're going to get a new body in heaven. You have no, you have no way to know that. <laughs> and this is for all, you know, this is the only body you got. And at least for now, that's definitely true. And there's no reason not to tap into the latent superpowers that you have to, you know, when it, when you say you create your own reality, the only thing in your reality that you create are the changes in yourself. You can't change nature and you can't change your own nature, but you can align with the healthier aspects of nature, with the life force energy of nature. And yeah, feeling, feeling good is its own reward. Um, I just wish that we hadn't all been conditioned to think that stuff that's bad for us feels good and that stuff that's good for us is, feels bad, man. Like that was the, that was an amazing trick they pulled on us. I, Remember when I was a kid and all I would eat was like, you know, meat and potatoes and bread and cheese. And if my mom ever put vegetables on the table, my dad would be like, ew, no, gross. Don't touch that. Blech. Because, you know, that's how he chose to eat. And that's what he thought. And so I was programmed with that belief. And then, of course, every other cartoon, if they showed like a carrot, people were like, ew, nasty or lettuce. Ew, gross. What are you, a rabbit? So it's in cartoons. It's other kids to like begin mirroring this back to you, especially if their parents were teaching them this. And they say that your taste buds change at a certain point, but I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to go look it up to verify, but I don't see how your taste buds change. They are the same functional taste buds. I mean, yeah, you replace all the cells in your body every seven years. But what I'm getting at is I think the thing that changes is our gut biome. And those bacteria that colonize us are really very particular in what they want to eat. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I silenced this thing. They're very particular in what they want to eat, the bacteria inside of us. And, uh, you know, they actually give us feelings and moods and cravings and food preferences. A lot of that stuff is coming from our 
gut biome. And I mean, there's neurons, brain, actual brain matter in your gut, in all your organs, I think, but definitely in the gut. And so if these bacteria are plugged right into that neural network that connects to the rest of your nervous system, it's not a far stretch to think they are the ones that are changing your taste buds. And I say all this because if you feel like, oh, I can't change my diet, I just can't give up the foods that I I like. I mean, I've seen I've seen elderly people check out way earlier than they needed to because they just would not change the way they ate. I mean, to them, that was their life. And it's an attachment, guys. It's an attachment, but it's also a possession. <laughs> it, it, like you're possessed by the stuff inside you that wants the same stuff it always had. And you can change it. Uh, cleansing. I mean, a colon cleanse will do it. Colon cleanse followed by probiotics and change your diet at that point and see how easy it is to make it stick. See how good it tastes to eat vegetables and fruit more. I'm telling you, it's good. <laughs> uh, I should take my own advice, though. I could use a cleanse. Yeah. I could use a coffee detox. There's a lot I could use, but. Yeah, I mean, we're all there. We're all doing the thing the best we can, sort of. I mean, if I was doing it the best I can, I guess I would be already cleansed. But yeah, life is a journey one step at a time. I know you guys are all out there with me like, yeah, we can do this. We can become healthy. We can love being in our bodies. We can enjoy heaven on earth and really bridge those two aspects of existence together. But I'm, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, other ways to support the show, if you want to, would be leave a review on iTunes. Let me just go pull that up and see if there's any new ones. I like to read new ones at the end because they're always nice. And it looks like no new ones for now. But hey, go leave me a review on iTunes. It helps other people find the show. It only takes like 30 seconds. You just drop five stars. You don't even have to write anything. You can also get in the show notes and find links to the secret energy store where you can get a cleansing kit, like what I'm talking about. If you use my link, I get a nice commission. And hey, you could too. It's really easy to sign up for their affiliate program. And they got cool products. I've tried a lot of them. So that's one way you can support the show. Uh, share it, of course, with people that you think would like it. I'm not talking about just like sharing, hit the share button on Facebook. Trust me, <laughs> that's not going to go anywhere. Not with this content, not with the flags on uh, algorithms against me or whatever. I've been saying the wrong words <laughs> too many times in the wrong combination. The AI does not like. So share it in person. Send somebody a text, like tell them about it. If, if you know that they would be into any of the episodes we've done recently, just give them a direct link. That's the real way you're going to help Interverse get to more minds that are interested in this type of expansive conversation. So you can help me out that way. Uh, I'm also on, you know, Instagram, Facebook. You can follow me there, share stories there, stuff like that. But yeah, I'm going to play us out with music by a listener to the show. Guy hit me up on SoundCloud and sent me a link to his album. And it's super awesome. You can find him on SoundCloud, Quinn Lee. And I encourage you out there, if you make music, send me your music. I'm always looking for new music. And I like to feature stuff that I'm listening to this week. In whatever week on the show, as you know, from being an avid listener as you are. So the song I'm going to play is Palace of Balance, and it's really cool. And when somebody hits me up and is like, I made this, I'm always really happy. And this is one of those times where it's really cool. Like, holy crap, you made this? Wow. So hope you enjoy it. Check the notes for links to Patreon, the ways to support the show, and to Quinn Lee, Palace of Balance. Awesome track. Give him a follow on SoundCloud. and. Thanks, man, for sending me that and for the nice message. Love hearing from you guys. Oh, yeah, you can join the Discord server, too. I'm getting new people all the time. It's a little quiet in there. I've been kind of a ghost. <laughs> ah, life's hard. <laughs> I'm happy, though. And man, maybe I'll tell you about hard stuff from this year sometime in the future once I have a better handle on it. But without getting too personal, whatever difficulty you're going through, I'm right there with you. We're on the same thing. It's all one soup of fractalized energy. And uh, the best we can do is love ourselves and let that love radiate out to all of existence and reality. And I'm out of here. I love you guys a lot. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to catch you guys on the next week's show. And 
Talk to you soon. A race of hate, that's the fate. What's for sure, nothing we make. Change is made, then time escapes. This life's a dream we can't awake. Come to change, then changes come. Two thumbs, I'ma face them high. Up and away, no stop signs. Up, up and away, no stop signs. We got the balance, we got the balance, the balance, the balance, the balance, the balance, the with the sound elevate my mind and keep it up and sit down looking and searching and finding for things excited my brain in the funnest of ways running and bumping the speakers aloud running and bumping the speakers aloud patiently waiting and thinking i'm making a different creation to keep meditating and positive thinking and shaking the fix to be wasting the minutes and all of the day so breathing as i take it slow maybe it can help me go everything that isn't so maybe i don't want to know i just want to Look at the balance around us. Look at the balance around us. Look at the balance around us.